Hey, good morning class, and welcome back to the chapter 27 lecture um, for super students. This one started uh, yesterday, and we went through the first six slides in the PowerPoint. For this next one, we are going to jump into slide 7 through what I believe is 13. So I want to start with slide 7, um, Sputnik and the space race. With Sputnik, um, you know, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957 uh, and put a satellite into space, you know, the United States looked at it like they were in a position where, oh my God, we're losing out. And you have to remember, this was the Cold War where neither side ever wanted to be outdone by the other. Um, as a result, the United States would, you know, award over $250 million, over a quarter billion dollars in grants so they can upgrade science facilities. And what we kind of did, if you look at education funding at that point, was, you know, we, we put all the money in the top, um, you know, and they were kind of, you know, the, the critics would say, you know, you were kind of ignoring the bottom, which is that, you know, the, the, the beginning of education. You can't just dump all the money into the top. But that's ultimately what they did. You know, they wanted to train the best and the brightest so we can compete with the Soviets in our space race, right? Moving on. Speaking of higher education, and moving on to what is slide eight. Sorry, I'm just looking down at the PowerPoint on the uh, Chromebook I have in front of me. So what you see here is really an increase in college students. And ultimately, by the 1970s, it's really a result of the baby boomers. Right, you know, because when the baby boomers hit college age, obviously college enrollment, you know, shoots through the roof. There's other reasons for that increase. You know, the soldiers returning home and taking advantage of the GI Bill, the National Defense Education Act, you know, and really the government pumping money into schools and creating these programs for you know young Americans to enroll themselves in. You know, it. Mid-century America was not a country in which, you know, you get preached this whole theory of every kid needs to graduate from high school and go to college, which is kind of what you hear in, um, often in high schools today. It was a different economy. You know, there, there were Americans, I mean, you take our own community where, you know, you could graduate high school, you know, a high school diploma, which isn't worth much in the economy today. You could go get a job in a factory. A trade union and, and make a middle class living, right? You could buy a home, you could send your kids to college, you know, you could, you know, go on a vacation here and there. I mean, you could ultimately live a middle class life. That America was alive. So, you know, it wasn't the, uh, the America today where college kind of gets pushed on to students. Um, but you did start to see it, you know, increase. Moving on to what is slide nine, Eisenhower. Um, you know, Eisenhower is a middle of the road president. And to understand Republican and Democrat politics, you need to really look at the depression in Hoover versus FDR, right? So, you know, let's take Hoover, you know, laissez-faire capitalism, less federal government involvement in the economy, less regulation, um, tax cuts for big business, right? Trickle down economics. You take FDR, the Democrat, and it was government intervention. The government can regulate the economy. The government can create programs to, you know, kind of prime the pump. And I mean, if you think about what we're going on with right now, you know, you've kind of heard a little bit about that. So take New York State. Obviously, we are the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in this country. And with the economy shut down, New York is losing tax revenue because people aren't spending, people aren't working. So with that said, you know, they're looking for federal stimulus, right? Um, you've heard Mitch McConnell, the Republican senator from Kentucky, right, who um, leads the Republican Party in the Senate, basically saying, you know, we're not going to bail out blue states, you know, so getting into the Democrat Republican I, 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 idea of it. So, you know, what Eisenhower did was he kind of stayed in the middle. He said, you know, I'm not going to get tax cuts. And at the same time, I'm not going to launch all kinds of massive spending programs, despite the fact that our economy was slowly starting to recede after the Korean War. And you did see unemployment start to climb a little bit in the mid-1950s. But like we said, economically, for, for many, that was still a, a, a golden age in this country. Not all. And that's one thing you need to pay attention to, because... You guys are going to read Man Child in the Promised Land, and as you're reading that book, you're going to realize, yeah, that this golden age in the American economy, um, you know, was not for um, people, you know, growing up in inner city uh, minority neighborhoods. Moving on to what would be slide 10, coups. 
the Central Intelligence Agency. So class, the, the difference between the FBI and the CIA, right? The FBI is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They investigate federal crime at home domestically. The Central Intelligence Agency is the American spy network which operates abroad, right? And they gather intelligence in, in foreign countries, not to say they don't have a presence domestically. All right, um, a couple of things in here. There's a few examples. Um, you know, from you know, the, in the 1950s, you know, giving money to fight in to the South Vietnamese government to you know fight against Vietnamese nationalists who really want to nationalize Vietnam and turn it into countries. We'll get to Vietnam. Uh, I believe that's next week. Um, you see money being put into. Uh, you know, Guatemala to sponsor a military invasion, and arguably the greatest example is the Iranian um, Revolution, which would be a result of our coup. You know, 1953, we dispose the Iranian leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, in Iran. At that time, you know, we were seen as liberators. You know, the United States, we had a warm relationship with Iran. Um, Truman wouldn't do it, so it was done under Eisenhower. He gave the green light. Um, and we put a man known as the Shah of Iran in power. The Shah would remain in power until the 1970s, and it was in 19, um, the, during the Iranian Revolution in 1979 when the Shah of Iran gets disposed and um, the Ayatollah Khomeini comes to power. And that's the government which has been created in Iran in the late 70s, which the United States doesn't necessarily have the warmest relationship with. So why did we launch that coup? You know, why did we dispose Mohammad Mossadegh when we were, you know, seen in a positive light in that country? Because he wanted to nationalize Iranian oil, which would have hurt British Petroleum. The gas company BP, you may have heard of them, and they were our ally and we were protecting their economic interests. So these, these are like, you know, covert operations, the United States interfering in the affairs of other countries to benefit, you know, our economy, um, prices of commodities and or benefit the economies and the nations of our allies, all right? And, and this is what sometimes gets, you know, people um, frustrated with, you know, the American foreign policy abroad. Moving on to slide 11, uh, Eisenhower in his farewell address warns of the military industrial complex. And he basically says, you know, military and industry are forever linked. And this complex relationship is going to get the United States into foreign wars and into economic problems. Um, was he foreshadowing? You know, I mean, you know, think about it. You know, you had Vietnam um, occur in the next decade. You know, we get to a point where we have half a million troops there. If you look at some of the conflicts we've got in uh, abroad, whether it be um, Iraq in 2003, um, you know, Afghanistan, you know, we have troops in over 100 nations on earth. Like this military industrial complex has it gotten so big where, you know, how do we afford that and afford to take care of our own country as well? You know, and that's really what Eisenhower is worrying about because he's basically saying, you know, that, that if this spider web continues to grow and the power of the military industrial complex begins to grow, it obviously can have adverse effects on, you know, the United States at home. And last but not least, slide 12, JFK's new frontier. Um, President Kennedy gets elected to start the 1960s and Kennedy was a guy who was made for television. You know, I always argue, you know, you know this is the, for the beginning of, uh, televised presidential debates, um, which is obviously commonplace today. And Kennedy comes in and he runs like a traditional um, Democrat campaign. Let's look at some of the things he advocates for. Minimum wage, federal government giving money to education, federal government increasing social security benefits, the federal government promoting medical care for the elderly, supporting public or government housing for the poor. All right, so these, you know, like Republicans would typically criticize stuff like that, is that is government handouts, right? You know, the government should stay out of the economy, not be so involved in the everyday lives of Americans. Well, Kennedy um, shines on television, and we'll, we'll talk about the Nixon-Kennedy debates, I believe, on next unit. And, um, you know, he goes and he launches and he promotes traditional Democratic programs. That is the end. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have one more slide here. Oh, the Cold War. Yeah, Bay of Pigs in Cuba. I'm sorry. I thought this was only on 12 slides for a second. Um, Bay of Pigs. Kennedy inherits the Bay of Pigs invasion. And the Bay of Pigs invasion was a CIA-sponsored plan. We were going to lead a bunch of Cuban revolutionaries who wanted to overthrow the communist dictator Fidel Castro. And remember, Cuba is always going to be significant to the United States because it is 90 miles off the Florida Keys. 
So the CIA trains these Cuban exiles and we plan an attack in Cuba. Castro crushes it. Well, let's think, how does this make the United States look? It makes us look weak, right? Here's this third world country who puts down this rebellion where the big bad United States, you know, trained, right, sponsored, gave aid, money, weapons to all these revolutionaries and, you know, Castro just puts it down. So we kind of come out of that with egg on its face, you know, Kennedy takes the blame. Um, but that's only really beginning in Cuba. A couple years later, 1963, you have the Cuban Missile Crisis, which will last for 11 days. American spy planes fly over Cuba and they see Soviet nuclear missiles, which could hit American cities like a city like New York in about 15 minutes, right? Miami would hit it in less than 10 minutes. So Kennedy demands the immediate withdrawal of those missiles. Now, mind you, you know, we had missiles in Eastern Europe aimed at the Soviet Union. So it's not like we didn't have missiles, um, you know, on their border. Uh, and the two countries get what's called like on the brink of war. Um, Kennedy would demand a full quarantine of the island and he has American ships, um, so, you know, surround the island and uh, you know, kind of blockading everything that comes in and out. And ultimately, you know, Nikita Khrushchev would withdraw the missiles. Um, but, you know, this is arguably as close as the two countries ever came to nuclear war. You know, the tension was very, very high in this country and there was a lot of fear about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop there for today. Uh, I hope you guys are all doing well. And like I said, I wish I could get this in person. If you have any questions, send me an email. Take care.